Good afternoon, my name is Miriam Aliso and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, a framework for youth development and youth leadership. Before we started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. To the right of the GoToWebinar PowerPoint is the GoToWebinar control panel. This is where you have the option to select the way you hear the webinar, raise your hand, and ask questions by text. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your question on into the question for staff pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Uh, you can also download the webinar slides and uh, the two handouts. They are available to you on the GoToWebinar control panel. And you will notice on your screen a screenshot of an example of the GoToWebinar interface. You should be seeing something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. And you are listening in using your computer's system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and dial in information will be displayed. Be sure to put in your unique pin. Also, the control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, click the view menu and uncheck auto hide control panel. Today's presentation will be recorded and will be available on the RAID website. Josie. Hi everyone, it's great to have you joining us. Um, and I have the privilege of having an old friend of mine be a part of this and who has done a beautiful job at um, providing us with two brand new youth engagement toolkits. Um, we heard from you this spring that you wanted more toolkits on how to engage young adults in your work. And so we we provided um, and so, <laughs> I am introducing Ali Rasak. Um, she was the primary contributor, designer, writer of the youth development and youth leadership toolkits and is an independent contractor. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Josie. I was actually thinking about that today, how long we've known each other and that this was cool to get back into the swing of things and be able to present this webinar today. Um, I'm so excited to be with everyone. Um, so we can go to the next slide and do a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to have kind of kick it back to Josie to do a little bit of an introduction about RAISE um, and then we're going to set the stage for what we're going to talk about for the next 55 minutes or so. 55. Um, yeah, yeah, so if you've been with us before, you know that RAISE provides technical assistance for parent centers throughout the country, um, supporting youth with disabilities in transition and their families. Um, so what we have done for the past six years, and this is actually our final webinar under the current grants, is we have shared and provided toolkits, webinars, email resources, social media, um, to make sure that we are sharing all the best practices and new ideas to all of you. Um, and that's why I brought Allie. Yeah, so that leads us right into um, why I feel very lucky that Josie brought me on um, to talk about kind of taking that next step. So it's great to hear that everybody loves the Youth Engagement Toolkit. Uh, and that they wanted more. And we're gonna talk about how that kind of leads into the things that we're going to discuss today, which is youth development and youth leadership. 
So we can go to the next slide. So Miriam mentioned some ways that you all can ask us questions. I would like you all to sort of find that question box. Um, typically, if there's anyone on here that's ever been in a training with me, I'd like to be very interactive. So as you can imagine, these virtual times have been difficult for me, but I still like to try to be as interactive as I can with you all. Um, so I want you to find that question box and type in, I know it says a question, but you can type just general words um, and add into that chat what role you most identify with. So do you feel like you're really here as a parent, as a professional, um, or if there's some other role that you identify with mostly and that being why you're here, I want you to add that too. And then while you're there, um, add in why you signed up for this webinar and what you hope to get out of it. We obviously have some things that we wanna talk about within the next hour, uh, but if there's something specific that you're hoping to hear and I'm able to address that during this time, I'd like to try to do that for you all. I'll give everyone a little bit of time so we have questions and I'm gonna be a bug and ask even more questions as we go through. So hopefully we have some folks who like to chat a little bit. And if you're having every, any difficulty, we can always have you raise your hand. Um, we've got some experts on here who can help with some of the technical difficulties. Maria, as you see things come in, can you let us know? I was sneaky as well, and I popped out the question box so I can see. I'm very yeah, slow to there's... answer, so. And I feel like it's Wednesday and it's two o'clock and we're all a little sleepy this week, but we really do want to try to interact with you guys. So as you're able to, I'm going to keep going, but please keep answering these questions um, as you're able to find that question box. So you can go to the next slide. All right. So we're going to talk about the general goals of today. Go ahead. Uh, so the goal for this webinar is to provide some context and relevance for these two new toolkits that we have. Um, we're going to discuss the structure of the toolkits. I'm a very uh, structurally minded person, and I think that uh, that's going to be beneficial to help give you guys some tools to, to take this to your own agencies. Um, but we also did hear that you guys really love examples, so we are going to get into some of the content of the toolkit. Obviously, it's only an hour, so we can't go through every detail, um, but hopefully get through some examples from each of the two toolkits to be able to show you how to use them. As an overarching goal, we want you to be able to leave this webinar tool that you can use with colleagues that will jumpstart you into more meaningful work with your youth. Go ahead. So let's talk about the importance first and foremost. Go ahead. So I always like to do a big picture and a little picture for everyone so we can kind of get context from both uh, angles. I think we can all agree with this first bullet that youth deserve to be in the driver's seat of their own lives. Uh, progress is definitely being made to put youth in the driver's seat and to be including them. Uh, but I think that more can be done in terms of youth leading their own lives. And that's really where this youth engagement continuum comes in. Uh, so you can see the graphic on the right, and I will explain it for you all as well. So on the bottom, we sort of have this timeline where there's intervention, which leads into development, which leads us to collective empowerment. And then that leads us to systemic change. And then above that, we sort of see the stepping stones of all of these steps. And the youth engagement toolkit that's already out there is wonderful because it provides a great overview of this idea uh, in its entirety and what's really included in youth engagement. So that first step is where a lot of us sort of live 
in this youth services approach and providing direct services to youth in some way, shape, or form. And these toolkits are about getting us past that step and into more of the youth development and youth leadership. And then once we get to become experts in that, uh, then we can start talking about the civic engagement and youth organizing piece. But again, we're focusing on those sort of middle steps where youth development and youth leadership and that development stage for youth. In terms of a little picture, I feel like toolkits can be overwhelming piles of resources sometimes. Um, I love them and I keep them. <laughs> and I often flip back through them to find uh, direct examples or activities and things like that. But our focus was to make something that was manageable and a little bit smaller so that we could teach you strategies and thought processes so that you can really customize this for your own agency. Go ahead. All right. So we're going on to the structure of toolkits. I'm going to feel like a little bit of a teacher. I don't see anybody's responses quite yet. So please, if you pull up your question box and you type some things in, we would love to start engaging with you throughout this webinar. Um, Allie, can, I, can I ask a question? Are there comments coming in or are we struggling technology wise? I am not seeing questions come in. Maria, are you? Yes, I do see, um, you know, people are, you know, there's a lot of activity going on there in the questions uh, box, so. Oh, great. Okay, so I might not just be able to see them. Okay, good to know. So, Maria, has anybody said what their roles are? Like, what the breakdown yes, is? That we have yes, yes. Yeah, we have um, executive directors, we have uh, professionals, parents and professionals. Some people are, you know, both uh, parent and professionals, a lot of professionals. Um, and I, I'm, I, you know, it's, it's so much going on there. So I'm going to try to look yeah. for some of the questions because you have the their uh, their role, parent or professional, and then you got questions after that. So, you know, some of them okay. do. So I'm going to look Feel through free it right to now. Interrupt me. I will. Thank you. Good. Yep, perfect. Thanks for asking that question, Joe. So good. I'm glad that you, I bugged you guys for no reason and you're all already experts at getting away to typing in that question box. Um, I'm happy to hear that we have a good mix on the call. And I think a lot of times when I ask that question, we have a lot of people that um, will sometimes say that they're wearing all of the hats. <laughs> so parent, professional, you name it, uh, that's their role. So uh, hopefully this will be helpful, I think, for all of those roles that we've had here. So like I said, we're going to get into the structure of the toolkit. So go ahead. So this is sort of a little bit of a structural guide to the tool, two toolkits that you all have. Uh, there's this guiding assessment that is, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, but it's called the Assessment of Youth and Young Adult Voice at the Agency Level. And the purpose of this is to assess the extent to which you utilize authentic youth voice and meaningful participation. Um, so that is kind of interwoven in some of the pieces of the toolkit uh, and an additional tool for you all to be using at your agency. The toolkits also include basics from the literature. So this is not a literature review. <laughs> there are not mounds and mounds of information, but we tried to pull what we felt was most relevant for what we were trying to get at in terms of those strategies and thought processes. And then each toolkit addresses five key competencies. So five key competencies for youth development and five key competencies for youth leadership. Within each of those competencies, you're going to see a little bit of background, the literature-based explanations of those competencies, and then what we are calling a framework. So this is a general translation of competencies to your work with youth, and it's going to just provide a starting point for you to be able to individualize this with your agency. Go ahead. So the guiding assessment, we're going to, again, just briefly talk about this. Go ahead. Um, it's frequently referred to as the Y-Bell. 
So okay. more acronyms. We know that all these, <laughs> we live in a sea of acronyms sometimes. Um, so this was created by our friends at Youth Move National and Portland State University. Uh, we can probably, I'm sure that this is floating around if you would Google it, but we can also maybe provide this in some way for you all as well. Um, but there are eight critical themes to a youth-driven approach that they've identified. And the assessment really breaks down components of each of those eight themes and then has you assess for yourself where you think you are on that scale. So do you feel like it's not as much developed, maybe at the midway point, or more fully developed? And they've done an amazing job at describing what each of those points would be for the different components. Um, so we won't go into that in great detail because we don't have enough time to do that today. Um, but these are one of the things that as you go through it, if you would ever come across questions, you could reach out to us. Go ahead. All right, so we're gonna hop into the content so that we can start to get some examples um, and get into some of the meat of these toolkits and do a little bit more interaction, hopefully, um, so that we can provide you with some take home strategies. Go ahead. First, we're gonna be talking about youth development. So if you remember back from the structure, um, each toolkit is started with something that we call the basics. Um, so these are things from the literature that are really like ground level ideas to keep in mind as you're building competencies. So if you're ever feeling lost and not sure what to do in terms of an activity, you can kind of look back to the basics and ask yourself, am I doing things that provide progressive leadership, decision making, sense of belonging, peer interaction? Am I doing something that allows them to develop their identity, build relationships? Things that include creative arts, physical and health education? And are we approaching things from a strength-based approach? If you can answer yes to those things, then you're on the right track. Um, so even as you're building all of these different competencies, think about activities that build competencies while providing these basics. And in the toolkit, we'll link these basics back to the themes of the assessment so you can kind of see where these things fall on that Y bound. Go ahead. So the five competencies for youth development that we have in this toolkit are social, which we define for this purpose as the effectiveness and appropriateness of their interactions with others, a moral competency, so sense of self, others and systems around them, emotional competency, so looking for positive emotional growth on both an individual and social level, physical competency, which is really this holistic view of mind and body, um, so not just getting outside, but what are we doing for mental health as well. Cognitive is the last one, and that's thinking and reasoning through assimilation and accommodation. So we'll talk about those things. Go ahead. Um, hi, so, um, Ali. I have. Yeah. I'm sorry, Ali. I have a question. If you want to take, uh, if I can ask this one now. Um, uh, someone asked if um, can you explain the strength based? I am unsure if I know the definition of this. Yes, that's a great question. Thank you for bringing that one up, Maria. So a strength based approach. Um, we can think about it very detailed, but it's pretty much what it says, which is. A lot of times youth, um, and I think especially youth with disabilities, are approached by a deficit model um, or things that they can't do. And we're addressing the things that they can't do as opposed to looking at what their strengths and what their skills are and creating plans that are based off of those strengths themselves. So if that doesn't answer the question, please feel free to let me know and let Maria know. And we can go back into um, a bit more of an explanation. But you'll see that 
these competencies are going to focus not really on um, a lack of social competency, but what we can be doing to utilize the skills that you do have in order to gain and build on those competencies. Okay, um, someone wanted to know, um, uh, someone asked uh, that she didn't catch what does YVAL stands for? Sure. So I'm even going to pull it up because I consistently get acronyms wrong sometimes too. So it is the assessment of youth and young adult voice at the agency level. Are great questions. Any others, Maria? Should I head into the first example? You can go ahead. Okay, perfect. Oh. Thank you. Keep interrupting me. Feel free. You're welcome. Okay, hon. Yeah. All right. So I picked a couple examples of. We're not going to go through all five because, again, um, we're limited on time. Um, but I tried to pick two that I thought were good examples from each of the toolkits. So the first one we're going to go through is from the Youth Development Toolkit, and that is the social competency. Um, this is, again, just a very general overview of some of the information of the that we have in the toolkit. Um, and something that I'll take the time to mention now is that we really want these toolkits to be a jumping point for you all. Um, so all throughout the toolkit, we encourage you um, and provide a little bit of information here and there of where you can go yourself to dive even deeper into all of these topics. So I encourage that again, even as we're talking here. So social competence will look different for everyone. Um, it's not something that is very black and white and easily defined. So that's why we're really going to be focusing on the effectiveness and appropriateness of interaction. So while I may interact with a friend differently than Josie may interact with a friend, if we are meeting the goals of whatever that interaction is, so whether it's asking for help or just connecting with another person about similar interests, if I can say I'm meeting those goals, then I'm doing that in an effective way. And if when I'm doing that and meeting that goal, I'm not making the other person uncomfortable in any way, and they're also having a positive experience, then we can say that that's also an appropriate interaction. So the literature points to some behavioral categories to consider that include representation of a social competency. Um, so looking at social values, a positive self-identity, interpersonal skills in general, um, some self-regulatory skills, planning and decision-making, uh, cultural competence is a huge one. Uh, that really leads into why we can't easily define what a, what a perfect social interaction is because they vary based on individual culture and emotional intelligence as well. So go ahead. So this we tried to use, um, and if you pull up the toolkits, which I think are included as handouts for this as well, um, this looks pretty similar to what you will see in the toolkit. So for each framework, we have some do's. So little tips on things that you definitely want to be trying as you're building social competency. We also have some don'ts. So things that you definitely want to keep an eye out to try not to do as you're building social competency. And then we have some guides for how to start talking about this with your own agencies and the colleagues that you work with in order to develop more programming around these competencies. So for our social competency framework, we definitely want you to consider what they like. When people um, have gone into this virtual format, I was on, as I'm sure a lot of you were, many different social media blogs and Facebook pages and all of those sorts of things, looking for social activities that we can be doing with our youth. And I myself, for the youth that I work with, found that the best method to find something was to bring some ideas to the youth that I work with and ask them what they want to do. So we all heard about these virtual dance parties um, and they looked like they were so much fun, 
but for me personally in my population, they didn't really like that. So that wouldn't have been as much of a success for them. So I have here, if your youth enjoy video games, set up something like a tournament. If they don't like video games, then you might wanna find something else. Another do is to start slow and then expand. Um, so for especially with the youth that have not had many social interactions, even sitting next to somebody at the table for lunch, I'm gonna call that as a win. Um, and start slow like that, creating many opportunities for social interaction and then growing to something bigger, depending on who your population is. Definitely recognize opportunities for growth if you notice that your youth, for example, tend to really shy away around another adult, use it as a growing opportunity. Maybe bring in youth, um, the adults that they're very familiar with, in the context of something that they're really comfortable in. So going back to that video game example, maybe we create an event where they're teaching adults how to play video games. Something that they feel a little bit more confident in in a safer environment so that they can start to engage in that social interaction. You definitely do not want to shy away from negative interactions. Um, I call that the bubble. We don't necessarily want to put folks into a bubble. Uh, dealing with negative interactions in a social context is really important for our youth because we can't keep that bubble around them. Um, for the parents on the call, I'm sure you recognize this. Uh, we can't keep that around them forever. So allowing the negative interactions to occur in an environment where you can help the growth of that will be really important. The last don't is do not think a one size fits all. Um, so culture plays a huge role in how we define this. So be very mindful of different cultural contexts for the youth that you work with and how you might be able to support that in your social events. So colleague conversations are going to be pretty similar. Um, again, I kind of built some structure around this. We're going to ask questions like, who's your population? Where can we start? And then some other places to check out. So those three things are going to be included in all of this. So specifically for social, we want you to be considering the age and skill level of the youth that you work with. Is it a really wide range? Um, if it is, that tends to make things a little bit trickier because you want to find things that are a good fit and age appropriate for each of your youth. Maybe you need multiple approaches as you develop social uh, events or programming. Youth are all individuals with different backgrounds, so you want to make sure that you're considering that diverse population. Again, remember the basics. So we're kind of tying right back into the beginning. It's a great place to utilize basics as a strength-based approach peer interactions, relationship building, and a sense of belonging. So making sure that we're not telling you that they are bad at social interactions and they need to get better, but let's find some things that they're good at when they're interacting with their peers and really grow on that. Some other places that you can check out, um, this again is just one, but the Division on Career Development and Transition created a fast track on social skills. Um, you can find that and a ton of other fast tracks at the link that is in that toolkit as well. Go ahead. So we're now going to get into some of that interaction. So my friend Maria, we're going to tag team on this a little bit as uh, different answers come in. Um, I would like to select just one volunteer. We're going to ask you some questions and then we're going to maybe work through the social competency framework to see if we can at least talk about uh, what you're currently doing and maybe even brainstorm an idea. Uh, so this obviously will have to be relatively quick. So we're not gonna be creating an entire event or a program here, but I wanna be showing you guys how to talk about this with your colleagues. So if you can let Maria know if you would like to be a volunteer. Um, and Maria, are you able to see their name? Yes, I do. Okay, so if there's a volunteer that comes in, I would just choose one and then we'll kind of go with whoever got to it first. <laughs> okay, I have uh, Clem, Kim Bledsoe um, who <laughs> says she would be happy to volunteer. 
Lovely. And Kim, nice. Nice to virtually meet you. So and if you also haven't already Amy Combs. Okay, so Amy, we're gonna do this again with the next competency. So we'll pick Amy for we'll do Kim for the social competency and then we'll talk to Amy the next one. How's that sound? Okay. So Kim, if you're able so we have your name. If you would be willing to put your role within the agency that you work at, um, or if you're a parent, you can also say that. We're gonna be looking at whether you have an existing youth group or program, um, or if you're looking to create one, and maybe just a brief sentence about what the intended goals are. Okay. Whether that's already, go ahead. Okay, Kim says that she is the transition coordinator for Cold Pepper School. Okay. And um, she's also a parent teacher resource center coordinator. Got it. So, all the hats. We're wearing all the hats. <laughs> all right. So, Kim, do you have an existing um, group or just the transition council itself? Are you looking to provide them with resources? Maybe we can unmute Kim and she can um, speak on, Ooh. on that. Is that possible? That would be awesome. Um, she says she's looking to provide the special ed teachers in grades six to 12. Okay. Is that Maria, is that something that we can do is unmute just an individual? I think so. I'm, I'm trying to locate her name now and the uh, okay. attendance. Uh, can, can, can. So we've already, as Maria, as you're doing that, I'll start to talk about this a bit. So it looks like um, you're in sort of the, we've identified a bit of the population. So six through 12, um, specifically you're coming from kind of a step up where you're sort of trying to provide resources for individuals who are working with that population. Um, so this, I think, adds a layer of complexity that's really important, which is um, a lot of us might be working with colleagues who are working with youth. So the conversations that come through this are going to be even more important, um, where you're talking about helping folks identify their own individual population. So specifically, um, if you're talking to individuals that are working with sixth and seventh graders, your conversations are going to be vastly different than they're, if they're working with eighth and ninth graders. Um, so working through some of that with them. Uh, the next piece that you wanna do when you're working through this framework is talk about your own levels of knowledge surrounding social competencies. Um, a lot of us have grown up into professionals and adults uh, just sort of figuring out how to interact, but we're not really uh, as aware, as cognitively aware of what the different components of a social competency are. So um, sometimes we need to brush up ourselves on what makes a good competency or what makes good social skills. And Kim, if you're still there with us, whether you're unmuted or can add into the question box, um, are there any do's or don'ts from that framework that sort of stick out to you as something that you either think your group um, of individuals are doing really well or uh, that you didn't think about that they maybe shouldn't be doing? Okay, I think she's gonna have to type it in because I, I, I believe okay. she says she has a computer with, without a mic. Okay, no problem. All right, she says that I, I feel that our teachers do really well with self-regulation. Good. I think that makes sense for a school population. I think that's oftentimes um, where we first go because that makes it easier to manage a classroom. So I think that makes a lot of sense. 
uh, any of the don'ts that stick out or uh, maybe at some of the do's that you feel like they aren't uh, as strong at, that they need some support then. She also says we use zones of regulations to help teach managing their emotions. And also in this current climate, we also are implementing social emotional learning. That's right. Social emotional um, strategies are, I think, something within the past few years that have come up as being really good building blocks to some of these social skills. Um, it sounds like a lot of what you're mentioning is individual work on the students. And I think it sounds like you have a really good start at all of that. So I would be um, brainstorming some improvements on how the individuals that they're working with can start working on those strategies together uh, to create those components of social interactions with their peers. Uh, and they ha already have a common ground that they're all working on these things. So why not work on them together in some way to start to build out um, that sort of extrinsic uh, interactions with one another. Any other questions that you have there, Kim? She says, one area where we struggle is helping our students begin self-advocating, building their goals, and communicating their needs. That is definitely a huge one. And I think that you'll probably find um, a bit more within the youth leadership toolkit, too, that leads towards some of that. Um, so that's why we start with the youth development, because a lot of it is that individual development and starting that process of interacting with other people. Um, and that's why I pointed that out as well, and where I would utilize this framework with your colleagues to say, how can we be providing environments for our youth to interact with one another? Because you'll find that as youth develop that confidence in interacting with somebody else, we can then start to apply that to other things where they might be able to advocate for themselves. Um, but jumping to advocacy before we take some of those initial steps, uh, we might not see as positive outcomes as we could if we build the skills first. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Keep questions coming in though, because um, I wanna get through to youth leadership. Um, we're going to try to move a little bit quicker through this because I do want to get to the leadership things as well. Um, so for our, our cognitive competency example, um, the literature a lot of times points to traditional intelligence. We do have a psychologist, um, Gardner, who has a theory of multiple intelligences. So that idea that it doesn't just need to be related to an IQ, but that we can actually be quote unquote smart in a lot of different areas, depending, again, on that strength-based approach and what an individual's skills are. So we also can talk about the stages of cognitive development, um, and that's on a very basic, basic level, that we go through these different stages, and that that means our brains are developed um, and capable of doing some different things. And there are even arguments that some adults perfectly healthy atypical adults will not fully progress into some of those final stages. We also, some of the literature talks about how individuals adapt through assimilation and accommodation. So that's sort of taking what is around them in their environment and being able to learn from that and adapt and sort of grow cognitively from there. When we think about cognitive skills, we want to think around three main components. So advanced reasoning, abstract reasoning, or abstract thinking rather, and metacognition or uh, thinking about thinking, which is one of my students' favorite things to say that they have no idea what that means. How do I think about thinking? Um, so that shows me that we definitely need to build those skills. Go ahead. So again, we're gonna kind of go quickly so we can get to that example. Um, for cognitive competencies, I tell everyone, make sure that you're using every moment. Um, any decision throughout the day can be used as a strategy 
to develop problem solving and thinking skills. And that leads directly into our other do, which is to directly talk about that strategy. So even if it's something as simple as picking what you want for lunch, talk about why they don't know. I think we've all heard the youth that we work with say, I don't know. I just don't know what I want to eat. Uh, okay, well, what are you hungry for? What have you eaten previously? Uh, really cognitively thinking through those things with them and identifying that it's a thinking process. Um, some of our simple decisions that we go throughout the day, we don't really realize that there's a process involved in being able to make those decisions. Something that you'll keep hearing from me and you'll see a lot in the toolkits, don't remove the risk. Again, we're taking them out of the bubble because that really helps with our critical thinking skills. How do we uh, approach a situation where we didn't expect that something happened or it didn't go as well as we thought it would go um, and really kind of work through that process again with them. Uh, and then don't do all of the work. So we just talked about a social competency skill and I mentioned that I was stressing myself out trying to find a virtual social experience for my youth. And then I paused and said, why am I doing all of the work? This could be a strategy in and of itself with the youth that I work with. Um, and now, depending on your population, you might have to help more or less, but be working towards a, giving them the opportunities to do that thinking themselves too and help them along the way. So again, be thinking about who your population is, um, thinking about what's going on in their lives, what stage should they be at around um, based on their age, and talk about realistic opportunities for their growth. The basics that you can kind of remember for these include obviously decision making, opportunities for progressive leadership, so they might help build those events and then it, maybe they will develop the events all on their own. And always, always go back to the strength-based approach. We have another tool there for you, who's, whose future is it anyway? Uh, it's a student-directed transition planning process, but it also has some really great strategies for youth taking charge and leading. All right, go ahead. So I think Amy, if you're still there with us, are we either able to unmute Amy or? Amy also has to type in her questions because she's, uh, her mic is uh, not working. No problem. Not a problem. So Amy, same kind of process. So if you tell us a little bit about um, where you're coming from, what agency or place are you working for, whether you have an existing group or not, um, you're looking to create one, and then uh, tell us a little bit about your population. And I'm going to try to keep us to about maybe three minutes or so with this one. Okay, Amy says that she is a parent educator at Exceptional Children's Assistance Center in North Carolina PTI. Awesome. Do you have a current group? She has a youth advisory team. Awesome. That sounds good. What are the age ranges for that? Um, comprised of North Carolina youth and disability ages 15 to 23. 15 to 23, okay, that's a really great age. And then our, what are the goals of that group? And as she's typing, I'm already going to start, I'm thinking, or I see Maria unmuted. What's up, Maria? She says trying to get them in the driver's seat. Yeah. Uh, I was going to start talking about that, that I imagine um, similar to what our friend Kim said about uh, getting students to be self-advocating um, and getting them to take the 
initiative uh, to be able to be in the driver's seat. So I think for this framework specifically, um, I would really be looking at uh, any of the do's and don'ts that stick out. Um, so thinking with those that you work with and the youth themselves too, have we really been utilizing all of the opportunities to make decisions? Um, so they don't have to be those really grandiose, um, here, who, youth advisory panel, make an agenda for this meeting. That's really a pretty far step beyond what they could be doing. But maybe sitting and asking them uh, what they think should be included in the meeting, um, or talking to them about how you decide uh, what might be included on an agenda or what items need to be discussed. Um, really kind of bringing them along for the ride so that they feel more and more confident about uh, what decisions need to be made would be my first step. So I know that was very, very quick, but we're going to keep going uh, to try to get to the other examples as well. Okay. She says that we're about to launch a youth newsletter and re really trying to get them to take the lead. And she asked each of them to submit content, anything they want. And still, it is a, a struggle to get some to bring their own ideas. Absolutely. So um, that, I think, is a great idea. I love the idea of a newsletter. Um, I would be asking questions like, what sort of um, media would you like to use for that newsletter to make sure it's something that they're comfortable with. Um, so it, that newsletter might not be email. They might want to do an Instagram newsletter or a Facebook newsletter where every week they put out a, a new flyer or a new picture that describes what's going on in their lives. Um, so asking them what kind of things they're comfortable doing or not even just asking them, but trying to think about do you see that they're on their phones on Instagram a lot? Or do you see that they're on Snapchat a lot? Um, and then enter into a conversation with them, meeting them where they are in all of that. The other suggestion that I would make is to make it a little bit more structured if you're having trouble getting responses. Um, I would say provide some sort of prompt for them. So right now we're all talking about uh, what we've been doing in quarantine and how we've been handling the pandemic. So if you have individuals that like to write, um, asking them to maybe write a little paragraph about how they've uh, dealt with being in quarantine or asking them to take a picture of what their family has been doing while they're in quarantine. So giving them specific ways to get their foot in the door to being involved and then continue to kind of pull back some of that structure um, and eventually getting them to come up with their own ideas once they see what kind of ideas could potentially be brought to the table. All right, we're gonna move on to the next one because we're already running out of time, but that's, I like running out of time because we're coming up with good ideas. So uh, we're gonna move on to the youth leadership. Go ahead. And I think we're only gonna do one example for this one. Uh, so basics for the youth leadership are uh, things like authentic experiences. So by that, we mean um, trying to do something that's as natural as possible, that's not feeling particularly forced. Uh, I just mentioned this, uh, meeting them where they are. So we can't ask for that step 10 until we've worked with youth on building step one, two, three, and so on. Um, modeling. So again, uh, that's even to pull back on Amy's example, if you come up with some content, if you haven't already, uh, come up with some content of ideas that you have for a newsletter to show them again what kind of ideas you, they can bring. Uh, leadership style, so recognizing that there's not one way to lead uh, and focusing on the strengths of your uh, individual youth and what kind of leader they could be sense of community and belonging. So making sure that they're feeling that sense of community around them. Again, pulling back to some things from youth development, opportunities for critical thinking uh, and developing in that process. 
And the last, one of my favorite things to consider is dignity of risk. So that phrase, if you haven't heard it before, is really talking about what we've been discussing in terms of um, breaking out of that bubble for youth, um, allowing them to do things that might not result in exactly what you want it to, but then being there with them and processing them. All right, go ahead. So five key competencies that we focus on in this toolkit include leadership styles, styles and strategies for engaging those around you, critical thinking and decision making, the so process of thinking um, and leading towards some goal, sense of community, which is com components that really create that feeling of belonging, responsibility, so the learning cycle of feeling and being accountable, and lastly, service, which is really the engagement of helping others that doesn't produce some tangible uh, commodity to them. Go ahead. So our example one that I pulled for this toolkit is the sense of community. Um, I pulled this because I think that it's not something that's terribly tangible um, or talked about too, too much in an explicit way. Um, again, definitions, in the literature surround a lot of different things, but they all include some kind of criteria that uh, makes somebody included or not included into a community. Um, a lot of experience of belonging, mattering, and meeting of needs. So we talk about four different elements to this experience. Uh, membership into the community, influence within the community, an integration and fulfillment of needs by being in that community, and some sort of shared emotional connection that ties everybody together. Go ahead. So our framework for a sense of community, um, again, so if you're talking about being in a school or being in an agency and having some sort of youth group, you wanna be making sure that you discuss roles. So part of that sense of belonging is that people feel like they are needed, but also that they're getting something out of being included in that community, uh, which is why we do want to create a method of reinforcement. Uh, we need to recognize that individuals have to have a sense of reinforcement in terms of what they are getting out of the group. Um, and I think we as adults all know that. Any relationship that you have where you don't really feel like you're getting much back in return uh, leads you to believe that you're not as involved in that community. Do go beyond the obvious. So being a part of um, your organization and agency is definitely a, a part of that community. But there's lots of other things outside of that that might be able to create that sense of community. Um, people are involved in many different communities. I could probably list 10 right now that I feel that I'm a part of. Recognizing that within all of your individual use as well. Don't ignore the history. So help them gain a deeper understanding about what unites them. Um, in Kim's previous example, we talked about uh, getting youth to start interacting with one another because they have this shared experience of learning about social emotional skills. So that's really important. And do not ignore intersectionality. So again, that idea that they're from many different groups. For these colleague conversations, we're going to look at three things. So what's your level of knowledge? I think this one's uh, Youth Leadership Toolkit in particular is really important to brush up on these different competencies yourself and realize what opportunities are out there. So looking back to the basics and then making sure you're checking there for different places that you can check out. For this one, we did uh, National Technical Assistance Center. Uh, they have a ton of resources, but we pulled one specific one for this competency here. All right, go ahead. We're going to go to the next one and see where we're at with time. I don't think I'm giving Josie any time at the end. By accident, Josie. All right, keep going. So the last example that we're going to do is our service example. Um, other terms that people might use interchangeably with this include service learning or civic engagement. So this is something that's a benefit to the community as well as the individual's growth. So it's shown that 
individuals that participate in service uh, have positive outcomes, um, specifically positive outcomes for empathy and desire for future action. This is becoming more and more integrated into education curriculum in general. Uh, so much so that there's documents out there that describe what successful engagement and meaningful participation in service includes, so that they're age appropriate, relevant personally, interesting and engaging, they relate to actions of a larger issue, and that the goals and outcomes are attainable. Go ahead. So these tie directly back into all of that literature. So your framework for service includes identifying relevant skills. So you'll notice that we keep going back to that strength-based approach. Um, so some of us find those places that will um, take volunteers and we just go to that place, regardless of what our youth are interested in. Uh, but you really need to be thinking about what your youth skills are, because just like in the community, if somebody does not feel that they're beneficial to an activity, um, it's not gonna be the right fit. So finding the right fit also includes finding things that they're interested in. Um, again, don't do it on your own. Uh, you are also within a community. So start reaching out um, to different resources and finding unique places that might be the best fit for youth. This last one is really huge that I see a lot. Um, which is just sort of jumping right into volunteering, which uh, is not the best strategy. Uh, volunteering is similar to a job in that it takes a lot of skill and preparation. And we find volunteering, if we prep for the volunteer experience, then we have more positive outcomes as well. So I'll just mention the place to check out. This site I love. Um, it's called do something.org and it is just a central hub for like a lot of different volunteer activity ideas, um, things that I've used even within my youth groups um, themselves, like little uh, activities or strategies to provide service to their community um, all together just in our agency room. Um, and then also volunteer opportunities that extend outside to different uh, resources. Okay, we're not gonna do the example for this unless we really want to towards the end, but we're gonna also put um, my contact information at the end. So if anybody ever feels like they wanna walk through some of these processes, I I'm more than happy to spend time doing that with you all. Okay. So I think, Josie, if you wanted to mention a couple of things, and then if we wanted folks, if they wanted to hang on for questions, we can maybe do that. Sure. Um, Allie, number one, that was fantastic. And we are really glad that you put this together and presented and had so many good examples. Um, for those of you on here and wondering where you can find these wonderful toolkits, um, you will be receiving it with the email of the link to see this um, this show after it's been captioned. Um, and so you'll get that. And then there will be an announcement going out very soon of its premiere on the raisecenter.org website. And so we are so excited for you to use it, share it, um, you know, and make it what you need to engage youth. And so, um, Marie, I think we can fit in a question, Maria. Any questions? Yeah, okay. I hear you, but um, no, right now there's not, there's none. Perfect. Okay. So, Sorry. Allie, thank you so so much. Um, if you have questions, any of you after this session, you can contact us. There's a get more information on the raisecenter.org, and we ask you to please fill out the evaluation that is coming your way so okay thank you, i have everyone. one question oh, Josie. One, one yep one question real quick what size groups do you recommend doing these activities with that's a very good question um and i think it really would depend um so that i'll tell you a little bit about what i think it depends on so it would depend on 
what are working on in particular. Um, I think it depends on the makeup of your group as well um, and what sorts of resources you all have. So I, I think that any kind of activity can be successful with as few as two people. Um, and as many, uh, we've done plenty of activities with youth uh, up to 50, you know, in a big like conference setting. So I think it, you really have to think about what the goals of the activity are um, and what your resources are. So is your population gonna need a lot of support doing that activity? Okay, well then if we only have two people to provide that support, then we probably wanna keep our group to maybe six or eight individuals. Um, if it's something where they're working together and it requires um, a bit more people just to get that activity done, then I think you can expand from there. Um, I would also make an argument that if youth are just beginning some of these skills, then sometimes a smaller group is better for that. Just again, trying to create those comfortable environments for them. Okay, that's it for the questions right now. Good. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Josie, um, Rays, and all of you for hanging out here with me and talking about these toolkits. Like I said, um, I love talking about this stuff, so I'm happy to brainstorm with you guys as you're working through these uh, at your own agencies. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.